Hi, and uh, welcome. Um, my name is Bradley Sumrall. I'm curator of the collection for the Ogden Museum of Southern Art in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm here with an artist from the exhibition, Entwined Ritual Wrapping and Binding in Contemporary Southern Art, uh, Susan Plum uh, from Houston, Texas. Thanks for being with me today, Susan. Hello, Bradley. It's really nice to be here. And uh, also, it's incredibly wonderful to be in the show that you curated, Entwined. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, well, you're, you're definitely one of the highlights of the exhibition. People have really responded uh, to your installation. Uh, a little background on Susan before we get into the conversation. Um, Susan Plum is a multidisciplinary artist currently living and working in Houston, Texas, the city of her birth. Uh, born in 1944, Plum was raised in Mexico City and painting was the primary medium for her early practice. And, um, she was heavily influenced uh, by the magical realism and surrealism in Mexican art. She attended the University of Arizona, Tucson, uh, the University of the Americas in Mexico City, and the Pilchuck Glass School, Stanwood, Washington. Uh, she's taught at Pilchuck Glass School as well, and the Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina, which is obviously a big part of our exhibition history as well. Uh, she studied with the shamans in Mexico and a pundit in South India, deepening her personal expression and understanding of ritual, which is a key element in the exhibition that she's included in, uh, in Twine. Uh, she creates bodies of work that reflect her environment, which include cosmology, quantum physics, indigenous beliefs of coexisting with nature, and humanitarian concerns. She believes that art can be a vehicle for healing, transformation, and social activism. So that's pretty heady stuff there, Susan. Uh, we'll go back to the basics. <laughs> all right. Right? Yeah. So, um, Mexico City, growing up, that's, that's uh, what an exciting place to grow up uh, and what a wealth of influence in the arts you must have received. Can you talk a little bit about where you came from and how you ended up uh, in Houston? Well, Mexico City was a tremendous experience. You know, what an adventure. I mean, that is it. It's a, it was a tremendous adventure. Uh, going from, you know, the market that I used to go with with uh, the cook on uh, Maria, you know, and hanging out with the shamans there and looking at their herbs and whatever it is that they're doing with whatever they're doing. Uh, that was what that was my beginning into a world of not knowing what was that, you know. Um, but all the all the excitement that goes around Mexico City and the diversity, the incredible diversity of it made that city a tremendous place to grow up and learn learn about that diversity, just what that diversity was. Um, I used to come to the United States with my family for a short period of time in the summers, you know, and I was always very impressed by the neatness, or what it seemed like, very neat. And all the houses had little gardens in front, and. I always wondered why they had gardens in front uh, and they could not use them, you know, like in Mexico, they have walls, so you can use all that. Right. So it, it, it reminded me of this neatness and I was always interested in that and the difference in the perspective of lifestyle and life perception, you know. Uh, Mexico's messy, you know, it's just messy and it's wonderful and magical. Um, who were some of the artists that inspired you when you were young in Mexico? Well, uh, I love the muralists. The muralists were very exciting. Uh, but more soul connection to me was uh, Remedios Varo. Oh, God, and, I love her work. Huh? I love that work. Oh, her work is incredible. And even though my work has absolutely nothing to do, you know, visually, uh, in, you know, from her work, but it was the, the message. I spent many hours trying to understand what, you know, the, the mystical elements of her work uh, and, and the occult, uh, the metaphysical elements of her work, which are really, uh, you know, phenomenal. They were. Uh, Absolutely. I definitely, I, I see what you're saying, that there's not a figurative uh, connection between you and the uh, surrealists like uh, Leonore Carrington or, but um, definitely that, that spirit is there, that uh, kind of 
um, um, nature cults, uh, nature occult uh, spiritualism, um, this kind of dark mysticism. I definitely see that connecting with your work even today. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can see the influence clearly. Um, and then when did you come to the U.S. Uh, full time? Well, full time, uh, I came to school actually, and uh, the University of Arizona, and also, of course, again, I went there for a while. My mother was ill, and so uh, when I was 15, I came here to go to school. Um, and I had a choice between uh, going to a oh, uh, girls' school. What's her? What Hockaday? Is that right? Mm or going and being at my cousin's house and in a small town America. So being the, you know, basic anthropologist that I am, I chose a small town America and right. went to Corsicana. I love Corsicana, Texas. It has the most extraordinary people in that town. Hmm. So I learned a whole new experience about being in the United States. And then, um, then I went to University of Arizona, which is really exciting for me. And it was a beautiful area of uh, landscape that I had not ever had that much connection with. So that was always, and I still to this day just love the desert, you know. Mm. So uh, I, ha I, I had some good teachers in Arizona uh, and then decided to go to Mexico, back to Mexico because the there were some really extraordinary teachers at the University of the Americas at that time. Mm. And I miss Mexico. I, I missed it a lot, so. And um, so God, what a culture shock that must have been coming from such a vibrant and huge uh, cultural center like Mexico City into a small uh, Texas town. You didn't get bored? You found inspiration there? No, I was intrigued and uh, amazed you know I I can't tell you some of the things I experienced because uh, I have to tell you that later about okay. that but, <laughs> but it was it was very much a surprise and always something new and interesting to discover uh, because it was so opposite of what I had been to you know and raised in right uh, yeah. so um Let's talk a little bit about your uh, your studio practice. I know you started as a painter, and you're primarily a glass artist now uh, that also is involved in installation art and uh, um, uh, ritual uh, performance. But how did that transition, uh, when did that trans transition occur from painting into uh, other mediums, and uh, and and what, what took you there? Well, uh, when, uh, I forget the year, 85, 84, 85, I went to India and spent uh, six months there. Mm -hmm. And I went to visit a teacher that I had met um, and had gone to a retreat uh, in Oregon in, I think, 1972. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally got to India in 1985, so it took me that long to get there. But it was well worth it. And... Um, he had been the teacher of mine for many years. He, he, was, a, he, he was a tremendous teacher with a, a background in the sacred, uh, sacred scriptures and books of India, extensive, and uh, also wrote quite a bit. Mm. So it was a wonderful experience. And, uh, and I have no idea exactly how this transpired. Uh, you, know, you know, these things happen, you never know. But I swear, I came back from India, and the next thing I know, I'm starting to work in glass. Hmm. Now, keep in mind, I, I was in the glass mecca in Seattle. I knew about glass. I'd been connected to glass, and I knew people in glass. And I thought, I'm never going to make glass. Absolutely not. And the next thing I know is I come back and start working in glass. So it was really quite uh, an intuitive thing. And I don't know if he put a bug in my ear, and that's how it happened or what. But um, I was very grateful for it, you know. I thought of glass, excuse me, just, yeah, because uh, I, when I got, I, I, I saw it for the first time, oh my God, it was like an alchemical experience. Mm. You know, it was a, Ginny Ruffner was using a rod of glass with heat and it had this light going through it. It was melting, it had air, it had fire, 
well, just about everything you'd ever want in anything is fire, air, and water. So that's what I almost fainted when I saw that. It was mm. absolutely beautiful, you know. That's what I was going to ask is what attracted you to the medium. So I'm glad you, you, you segued into that. But um, yeah. so, and then the glass work, um, did that precede large installation work or was that happening simultaneously? Simultaneously. Simultaneously. Um, yeah, even with those early on, I used other materials. Yeah. Well, before we get into the piece that we're gonna, um, that, that is included in Entwined, which is really just a showstopper. It's a, it's, it, you, we'll, we'll show some images, but you cannot appreciate it without being in the room. So I hope everyone who watches this uh, gets to visit. Um, but before we get into that piece, I'd like to s look at a piece maybe that preceded this in your larger installation uh, work. So I'm gonna start a little slideshow. Uh, with some images here. So, so from beginning, there we go. Um, so this is Falling Bodies Taking Flight. And this was uh, a 1992 piece. And these are images from an installation that you did in 2017. Um, but tell us a little bit about what's going on in these images, and uh, we'll move through about three images from this installation. The oranges are hanging from a ceiling on a filament wire, and uh, underneath them is a large, it's foreshortened here because the room was small. So we, it, you know, photographing it had to, we had to foreshorten, but it was a big uh, mound of, hazelnut branches mm. with glass branches on top. So we made a bunch, another whole mound of glass branches that fit on top of the hazel tree branches. And if you walked into the room, uh, there was an incredible stillness to that space. So I'm gonna talk about more of the vis visceral experience uh, because that's what these installations seem to do. and and uh, the oranges suspended like that. You could, there was this beautiful fragments also as you walked in the room. And if there was a slight movement, the oranges would move. So it was like planetary bodies or molecules just floating around. But also there's a sense of frozen, uh, frozen moment with that uh, glass there. It had this odd sense of freezing something in time mm -hmm. and um, the falling bodies uh, you know I, I it was originally inspired by a book by William Irwin Tonson falling uh, um, falling bodies fall to fall to earth and uh, this was more about bodies leaving earth and it had to do with that frozen moment of leaving earth so it had to do with uh, the natural life, you know, natural uh, nature in general, bees, all these things that work within the dimensions and are caught in a one liminal state. So that's what was happening. And it was around Earth. You know, we're talking about Earth and its movement and its cyclic, uh, both cosmic and, and earthly cycles. And then outside of that was this wall of milagros. And... Um, I was making offerings to the earth and the bees were there and the bee geometry here. So I was doubling the concept of the bee geometry by using sacred geometry in front of this image and the, and the bees, the oranges in the back show the, the beehive. Um, that's what a beehive looks like sort of. And so anyway, the, the bags were filled um, in the wall that you saw a second ago were filled with herbs and um, objects, you know, sacred little objects, and people could buy them off the wall anywhere between five and twenty dollars, depending on the size. So uh, the wall was actually painted a beautiful magenta, uh, which this, you know, somehow I never did capture that part, but uh, yeah. And so, oh, can you explain what uh, what you mean by milagros? 
Uh, Milagro is uh, a miracle. The translation is Milagro is miracle. Um, but also I think of them as in, in Mexico, in the uh, Catholic tradition, they have little metal uh, arms, legs, uh, that are all called milagros. And they're like offering, you put them in a sacred area to protect, for protection, etc. So this is like, for, for me, it was a milagro for the earth. And, and I was using the bees as the metaphor for it. And also because I love it so much. I love bees and I love their geometry. So you could buy the bag as an offering and take it home as a, like an amulet or as an offering and for protection or good luck or whatever you might want, you know, whatever that might mean to you. Yeah. Does that answer it? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, if we look at this installation, I really love the tension between the organic and the inorganic, you know, the, the, the living oranges, the dead branches and the uh, fabricated branches, the glass. Um, and there's this tension of like, if the oranges fell, they would break everything. So there's an immediate tension when you walk in the room. And of course, bringing fragrance into an uh, installation is something I've, I've never really um, gotten to work with and I, I, I hope to someday, but I love that, that concept of the fragrant oranges. Uh, in the space, kind of setting the tone for everything. What is the um, the kind of glittery uh, stuff on the floor? Is that that is uh, that was in the terrazzo or whatever it is on the floor itself, oh, which kind of, it made it sort of interesting in the photograph, you know. But it was the floor. It, but I did have a uh, on the um, hazel tree branches. I did put a a, a light coat of of a, an iridescence like a silver combined two different different uh, tones uh, because otherwise it looked kind of dead, just the branch itself. So I had to bring it out to you know the sense of, but it's so interesting you should say that about the tension. I really never thought about that. <laughs> That's so interesting, thank you. Yeah, and also yeah. this, this <laughs> you know, you think of tropic, the, the oranges as something very tropical. When you see an orange, you think warmth and sunlight yeah. and like the sunlight in a fruit. And then the glass on top of those uh, dead branches uh, is almost like frozen, you know, it's like ice. And so there's that tension there between the sunlight and the ice as well, you know. Yeah. I, lo I love everything about this uh, piece. I wish I'd seen it. Um, so, so let's go into Luzi Sadi Dadi Dad. Now, this is a piece that is installed in. Uh, entwined ritual wrapping and binding in contemporary southern art and I, I must say that this has six brooms and brooms somehow became a theme throughout this exhibition uh, with your work um, Jeffrey Cook's work and uh, uh, Friendswood brooms uh, from North Carolina uh, three actual uh, art brooms there um, and but there's so much more to this piece, so I'm hoping you will walk us through how this exhibit, how this uh, installation evolved, uh, what what it, what it what its meaning is, and what each of these elements, uh, the escoba, the matate, uh, what what they mean to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I was thinking about uh, earlier. I was thinking about uh, something Jane Goodall said. And that is that the first book she ever read was Tarzan. <laughs> and, uh, and of course it was Jane, you know, Jane. And that was like the book that she read her whole childhood. You know, that was the only thing available to her. And I was thinking about the brooms and I was thinking, gosh, you know, how, how did I get into this broom thing? But, you know, I remembered so distinctly uh, Francisca, our, our one of our helpers, uh, housekeepers, taught me how to sweep when I was about nine years old. And it was an extraordinary experience. It was a epiphanal experience. I fell in love with a broom. I felt there was something really magical when you get that, uh, whatever that is, the reed or the straw or whatever and you swoop it around and you make this beautiful sound, you know. Well, it was to me an experience. 
And I didn't think about that aspect of it until literally I was thinking about Jane Goodall saying that. And so that is really where my curiosity about brooms started as a child, as a young child. And uh, I felt really deprived that I hadn't been able to sweep until I was nine. But um, the other thing was that I also noticed the other thing that I thought was so beautiful is that every day people go out in Mexico to the front and sweep their, the entrance of their house, which to me uh, reminds me of India too, because they, they sweep and they also draw on the floor. So they, have, they draw protection. So then I started seeing this as a form of protection. You, you uh, sweep the old energy out and bring in a clarity for the new. And uh, so every day, this is an, a daily practice, you know, uh, from a total mundane thing to a much more cosmic thing. Um, I find that very interesting. One of the things I... Um noticed when I moved to New Orleans and started living in the in the neighborhoods uh, of downtown New Orleans uh, was the sweeping ritual uh, that happens uh, in the mornings with a, a generation that is starting to disappear now sadly but luckily I'm very very lucky uh, on my block that that ritual is being passed down uh, to the next generation so um, every morning um, usually before I leave the house <laughs> Uh, it well, not that I'm leaving the house anymore during the time of COVID, but uh, when I was leaving the house every morning, um, the, the the neighbors, usually um, older um, uh, uh, black uh, homeowners in the, uh, in this area, would come out and sweep the street, sweep the stoop, sweep the street, get everything clean and prepared for the day. Um, and to know that that happens also in Mexico City or uh, India, it's really, it's really a, a global thing, and you could, it's very easy, I think, to make that connection to cleansing away the evil of the night for the beginning of day. So it's almost like a universal uh, thing, and and of course the broom being tied to femininity, uh, female power, uh, often associated with witches. Um, there's so much to unpack uh, with such a simple everyday symbol. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, were, were those concepts being used also when you started working with the broom symbol? Okay, I hope I answer this. I'm not sure I, I, I will get the answer, but the, the first, my first idea for doing this project for Lucy Solidaridad was to actually sweep the border. So in my mind, I was fantasizing going, you know, from one side of the border and sweeping it from you know Texas out to California and back again on the other side, you know. Wow. And I think we estimated it would take me. Um, that is, if I was able to stay afloat, you know, for five hours a day or ten or whatever, it would take me like four years. So I decided maybe that wasn't the best idea. <laughs> um, but it was about sweeping and cleansing the border. Uh, which I felt was just a, an issue tremendously necessary, you know, and, and a kind of a combining uh, an, an act for both sides, you know, to kind of meet. Um, anyway, that, that was the original um, decision, that was the original idea for that. Um, but the broom, did I answer that question? Did you're, I? Yeah, you're, in, you're engaging it, that's for I, sure. <laughs> Uh, am I embellishing you? Yeah, I'd like to get into the the meat of this matter and and what how the how the broom made its way into this installation. So, uh, so yeah, the, was, the border sweeping, but then you discovered maybe another issue going on at the border. Yeah, but the broom uh, originally it just uh, it took me a long time to uh, uh, bring this about. You know, the whole concept of the broom which actually happened from a dream that I had of the mandrake root. And that was many years before that. So this thing has been brewing for quite a while. And, um, and so the broom seemed to take an, an interesting leap into from the mandrake root in my dream uh, into sweeping and carrying out on a lot of research on sweeping all over the world and many different ways of sweeping. 
And then, of course, it took me quite a few years, a couple of years to figure out what, what to make the broom out of uh, so that I could tie it in a nice knot. Uh, not many materials will allow you to do that. Natural materials, you know. Um, not not in this this design, you know. Yeah. Um, and where did you source the material? Did the material? Did you just happen to find it? Was it a? a yeah. A, Literally happened to find it. I, I had been. I made a couple of brooms in reed. I, I, I tried a lot of things. Um, I tried the brush companies and, you know, making paint brushes, big paint brushes and things like that in the United States and nothing. And I was at the market in Querétaro and saw this. And I had looked at some of these weavings they have uh, for chairs and purses in Mexico. And I hadn't quite connected it yet. And then when I went to the market and saw it in a roll, a skein, I thought, that's it. You know, that's, that's what we need. So uh, we were able to bring those skeins home and start working with them, you know. But oh. it, I never thought I, I, I was really about to lose hope in finding the right material. And so what does this, um, um, and you have the, the broom, the escoba, and the matates at the end, uh, which I can give a detail of the matate. Uh, with uh, some of your glasswork inset into the matate with the casting of the uh, Virgin of Guadalupe um, in there. Uh, and here's another view of the exhibition with Ed Williford's work in the background there. But um, So how did this go from sweeping the border into its current uh, iteration and what issues are you addressing with this? Iteration? Well, I decided that uh, it would be a good thing to narrow of course, I was also working with the concept of, vi of violence against women. Um, and uh, and that's what I was going to do to sweep the border because to me, the violence against women is not just in Juarez or in Chihuahua or even in Houston, let's say, but it's all over. Uh, it's a condition that has hit the whole, uh, I think of it as an epidemic. Um, but uh, so it, it, it was born out of the need to feel something that I could bring some sort of softness and and awareness and connection with uh, all these young women that have been losing their lives and violence against women in general. And so after deciding not to sweep the border, I've, I localized it in Juarez, which is where the real hub at the problem was happening at that time. Um, of course, it's moved around now as far as the numbers go, but um, so I decided that's when I, I, uh, get, I started getting in touch and back way back in like 1999 uh, was the first time I was able to get in touch with uh, a, a wonderful organization for the mothers who had lost their daughters in Juarez. Uh, um, um, uh, and her name is Maricela Ortiz, who was the director at the time. And, uh, and it was called uh, Regreso a Casa uh, in Ciudad Juarez. Uh, Regreso a, uh, Mis hijos a Regreso de, a la Casa. So they changed the name a couple of times, but um, they still are in existence. And, um, and so I, I went to Juarez and met with several mothers who had lost their children. Uh, and heard their stories. And I, that's when I decided that I wanted, I asked them if they would like to participate. And uh, rather than just writing about their story, to have them see if they would like to participate. And that's where the, it grew into also a ritual. Because they all said, yes, we really want to be part of this. Well, on the original iteration of this work, it was a larger installation that included um, 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 a kind of campaign of support uh, from people around the world that took photographs of lighting candles uh, and you did a wall of uh, those photographs and it also included a ritual performance I believe where you engaged women from the community uh, in a sweeping ritual with bull roarers etc. Um, so it was obviously a much uh, more ambitious project at the beginning and due to our um, space constraints, uh, we kind of um, 
isolated it into one powerful uh, moment uh, with these brooms. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about uh, the matates and how the matate uh, fits into this installation? Uh, the metate is an ancient, ancient uh, pre-Columbian tool for grinding. Uh, so it's a grinding stone and um, a very beautiful shape. You know, they're just really gorgeous shapes. And uh, I felt there was, I needed, it became the artifact for the installations and for, you know, for this, for this work as well. I mean, it continues to play the role of an artifact. And, um, and all the, you know, all the elements of both the installation here, I mean, the brooms and the concept of all this, as well as the metate, I felt like I wanted to dig way deep into the spiritual roots, the ancient spiritual roots of Mexico. And um, so all of these elements were part of the ancient uh, roots and uh, spiritual roots. And the metate with the Virgin of Guadalupe was the contemporary uh, virgin that they, which was preceded by Tonantzin, by the Tonantzin and Cuatlicue, uh, which were previous deities uh, and uh, were the main deities in Mexico and uh, both the Toltecan and Aztec and, and also maybe Mayan was the Isha. So, this is just a rendition of the, to show the lineage, uh, the spiritual lineage of that, of this, and using the metate was the ancient roots, also giving that element of the ancient roots, yeah. Uh, I like that the broom can symbolize this kind of universal um, awareness of, of uh, the femicide uh, mm -hmm. that is happening through uh, the murder of young women and human trafficking. Yes. But with this element at the end of the room, it ties it directly to culture and place uh, in Mexico and that culture. Um, I, 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 love, I love that sense of place that you bring to it with, through such a simple element and combining, opening up such a large dialogue by just combining a pre-Columbian tool with the Western image of the goddess that came after. Uh, so that you can talk about the history and the changing of culture and feminine power and the position of the goddess within the uh, within yeah. the culture. Now, within, I would like to talk a little bit about the the wrapping and binding aspect, which is the knot. Uh, not only the binding of what would traditionally be broom corn, I believe it's vinyl cord in this case, but uh, the broom cord is wrapped and bound uh, in a very traditional way at the top, binding that uh, broom corn to the um, uh, the, the, the broomstick, but then there's that knot, and immediately people think of the knot in a woman's hair, it's particularly um, uh, uh, a woman of native descent in Mexico with that straight, beautiful black hair tied in a single knot. And so there's that knot, but you've also told me that it represents more, including, uh, which I think is the most poignant thing, is that, that cutting off of feminine energy when you take those feminine voices out of the community. So can you expand on that a little bit? Well, I think, uh, I think the broom itself is a beautiful image and very powerful and very strong and all of the things that we've been talking about. But that's not enough to show to me what the act uh, or the action that has been going on for women um, for, well, quite a lengthy time, you know. So it's like, how do we portray in a different kind of way, you know, the bondage that has happened for women through eons, you know. And, um, and that's when I came up with a knot was the first thing that I could come up with. And I have I, I actually have been working for knots for many years before this. Well, not many years, but you know, five years or 10 years, something like that. And I, I worked very hard to try, to, and try to figure out how to get that knot going, you know. But it just was, I had to have it in there. And I swear, no matter what, I was gonna have that knot there because that was, if I didn't have the knot, I mean, it wouldn't have, it's not gonna have, it, the idea would not have been, um, 
conceptually sound, you know? Uh, so also the very interesting thing is that they become kind of archetypal because uh, people do see them as Japanese young women's Japanese hair. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. else, uh, other people walk in and see them as the, uh, the uh, Buddhist knot. So it is, it is changed, shifted into an archival element, I mean, an uh, archetypal element, you know, which I found really interesting. And, uh, and you know, the way you've hung them in this room is just so beautiful. Uh, I really appreciate your installation uh, because it, it, it gives them more a sense of a, a community almost, you know, of, of aliveness rather than in a line, which is the way we had originally done it, you know. Uh, I, I, I like this element because they're, there's connection between them. Very beautiful. Uh, and Also very immersive. When you stand in the middle of that room, oh, yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. it really just envelops you uh, completely. Uh, and it does feel like you're walking through a crowded, a cra you know, a room full of figures. Of, yeah, um, it has the presence of, of that. And you know, the interesting thing is uh, I love this part of it, you know, it, uh, when I have them hanging here in my house or other places, uh, the ch children love hugging them. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> they just, and I, I'm totally thrilled as far as I'm concerned. I let them hug those rooms any, however long they want to hug those rooms because they're so cute and so sweet when they're, they just immediately go up and hug them. Yeah, and, it, it does draw you in to do that. And, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm like, do as I say, not as I do, because no one's allowed to touch them, but the curator can give them a hug every now and then. And <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's funny. Um, well, um, let's talk, uh, while we have a little bit of time left, let's talk about uh, something, a piece that is not in the show, but has come, uh, that you made after uh, this exhibition, mm -hmm. that seems especially prescient uh, to our current situation. And that is uh, Naturaleza Culta, Hidden Nature. Uh, and uh, this is from 2013, Houston Baptist University, curated by our mutual friend, uh, Mr. Jim Edwards, brilliant, brilliant writer and curator. Um, and so I really don't know anything about this, so I'm really gonna let you take it away and talk to us about this installation. I've seen some elements of this piece and the glass work is just exquisite, especially the big pendulum in the back. Thank you so much, Bradley, I appreciate it. This work, uh, it's the first time I've ever done large drawings like that. And um, I, I started out with, um, with that as the story. It's like a creation myth for me. Uh, however, instead of us creating the creation myth, you know, like historians creating creation myth, to me it was nature was creating this creation myth. So the creation myth was coming from above, down here, which is why I use the pendulum and, uh, and why the pendulum is in here in the back. And it has to do with everything. Uh, the drawings show and exhibit sort of this shifting of everything going haywire, essentially, and uh, moving and in movement and the cosmos. Everything was moving. Everything is shifting. So consequently, way deep in the earth, in the magna area, in the iron core of the earth, there's also a lot of movement. So none of this were really, are we aware of, or were, this is 2013, at that time visually, because, or, you know, anything to do with that. It was just a sense I had. And of course I do research in science. So in astronomy, I was watching what was going on, which is a lot. And I thought, wow, we're really, uh, we're shifting like crazy. So that's when I did this. Um, I put all these pieces together in on top of this pen, this base, and uh, I kind of saw it as this floating uh, example, like a holding all the shift that was going on. And the triangle that's like about a 63 inch woven glass. And here we go back to the weaving and binding and. Uh, mostly weaving in this sense, of course, but um, to me, I was weaving, I called it weaving triangle, the building block of nature. And um, so it's, it goes down to the basic part of the 
a building block. So that is the central part of this uh, um, installation here was that building block. And so it's almost like the shift of the building blocks that we have in nature right now, which are the primal things are moving. And so then we have also natural elements like uh, a gourd uh, and several other aspects of it you can't see here, but there's two gourds, beautiful, uh, ain't, these gourds I bought in Fort Stockton. Um, no, where was it? Not Fort Stockton. Somewhere near us, uh, Berkeley. Um, I can't, re oh, I can't remember the name of the place. But they had this mound of, of gourds and I just thought they were so beautiful. So also I have in the back, there's glass knots. There's a lot of glass knots that you can't see from this angle of it. But um, so the whole piece is about everything shifting. And um, over here on the right, you can't see very, very well. But here, yeah, over here on the right are these, these like fragments of this, like they've flown off and got, gotten onto the wall, you know? So they're miniatures of this. Oh. Yeah. Um, I know that you're a dowser. Uh, did the, does the pendulum come from that history as a dowser or? or yeah. yeah, so dowsing and scrying and. Um, yeah. So that's part of your practice as well, okay. Yes. Um, I think here's an, a close up of the drawings, which are just beautiful. They're really beautiful. Thank you. Uh, they seem to glow with a light from within. And are these uh, like, what are these called? These are like dream catchers? No. Um, well, you know, this is odd because um, they're called uh, Ojo de Dios, which are uh, translated eyes of God. But I saw them as sort of rhomboids too and, and um, uh, you know, sacred geometry. And so rather than, I'm not, I don't work with, people that much in my work um so i but i wanted to put the essence of people in there so i ended up using the eyes of god as a as a metaphor for people mm. and this triangle shape that you see is actually uh kind of the what i think of all the energy bodies you know they talk about that in in kung fu and qigong in in uh all all uh, Asia, they talk about, you know, the aura, you know, so you have the, so to me, those are kind of like the aura and the center where the, where it crosses around is the heart. And so then from each, each of these, uh, I draw a line. So it's almost like nature is weaving its own web. Um, but I think, I think these, these triangles or rhomboids work very well to symbolize you know, it's almost like souls coming into the earth. Mm. Uh, and, and instead of drawing figures, I drew the energy body, uh, basically, yeah. Mm, beautiful. And these are, these uh, yellow uh, ones, they kind of remind me a little bit of uh, bees, you know, uh, pre-Columbian bees. Ah, yes. Yeah. Very beautiful, and here's another uh, drawing. I'm sorry, our images are over part of that, but uh, you can see uh, more of the installation there as well. Uh, well, this is just just beautiful, and and indeed, um, this kind of story of chaos, of <laughs> uh, uh, the world moving towards uh, chaos, and uh, it seems to be prescient uh, for our times uh, today, but also hopeful that there is some order. Uh, to all of this um, i i don't know you know i think um i hope that all this change you know is spinning us kind of deeper into a sense of a kinder uh more aware uh collaboration with nature and uh humanitarian efforts you know and egalitarian efforts you know uh and i do feel that for me, you know, these drawings do show a sense of beauty in the transition, which may be chaotic, but maybe ultimately quite extremely beautiful or something that we will experience. I'm just saying that, right? I'm just hoping. I'm just hoping.
Well, we can always hold out hope, but I, I, I have a feeling that in the end, um, Mother Nature and these natural systems will win out regardless <laughs> of whether, <laughs> of whether yeah. we uh, stay in the fight or not. Um, well, we need, to talk to, we need to talk to Mother Nature really quickly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, Susan, it's been a real pleasure to work with you and to talk with you today, but to work with you on this exhibition, I could not be more pleased with the installation. Uh, like I said, I really think it's one of the strongest moments in the show. And um, I believe I'm, I first met you through our mutual friend, uh, friends, uh, Sharon Capriva in Houston and, and the late, great Nancy Keenholz, um, whose spirit is with us, uh, even though she's no longer. Uh, with us here on this plane, but uh, I believe she would be happy to see your work installed at the Ogden, as I know I'm certainly happy to see your work installed at the Ogden. Well, I'm going to be very excited to see the work. I just I love the idea of this show. The concept of it is just incredible. So timely, Bradley. You know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it from all of us. Really, it's a uh, extraordinary how that happened. I think I used that word before tonight, but it it is keenly aware of our times right now. It's, it's so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I love, I love Sharon's work. Uh, she's a good friend of mine, obviously, as we said. And uh, other, I, I, the brooms are wonderful. The Appalachian, uh, I can't think of the, the name of them. The Frenchwood brooms are just so beautiful. The Gates family, they're wonderful. You know, I hope that we can all be together in seeing this beautiful show. So well, I look forward to you um, to you seeing. I wish Jeffrey Cook were still alive so that he could see his work included in the show. He's the one artist that is not living, but he has uh, three brooms hanging uh, from the bottom of one of his uh, major sculptures in the show. Yeah. Um, and the way the different ways the artists have used the brooms to comment on different things, uh, his broom actually has a, his brooms has a very close ties to your brooms though because. I was talking to uh, Ron Bechet, uh, who's an artist and educator here in New Orleans and knew Jeffrey very well. And he said that the brooms that Jeffrey used in that piece, which obviously the piece ties back to African culture and, and gay bay culture in particular, but he was making it personal through uh, his grandmother's rituals. And okay. uh, he said that uh, he remembered his, his grandmother uh, was a hoodoo practitioner and she had a cleansing wow. ritual that she used Florida water and sweeping uh, to cleanse an area. And so he was bringing that into his work as a personal remembrance, you know. And that, that ties so beautifully to your brooms and, and how they developed and, and their meaning as well. So his, I really love your work. Uh, it is so, so soulful and so beautiful. Thank you for telling me that. I didn't realize that about the brooms, his brooms. Yeah, yeah. his brooms are. And, and also, and the Friendswood brooms have been, uh, people buy them. Uh, sometimes just to hang on the wall as art pieces, sometimes to actually sweep the hearth with, uh, but oftentimes they're used for wedding ceremonies and ritual uh, ceremonies. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there is that element of ritual with all the brooms in the show. And of all the artists in the exhibition, I believe you are most clearly tied um, to ritual uh, because it is actually ritual as part of your practice. Uh, and uh, through the, the, the spiritual representation that you're using with your work uh, is also deeply, it's a ritual act of creating. Um, so uh, with that element, uh, you're, you are most deeply tied uh, to the concept of ritual in this exhibition. So. Mm, thank you. Really appreciate it, Bradley. Well, uh, Susan, thank you so much for being with us. I think we've run out of time, but I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation. I know I did. And I look forward to seeing you in New Orleans uh, when you can make it, when things uh, get a little better. And the exhibition will run through February, or well into February, I should say. Um, and I hope everyone can get to see it. If not, we have really good images online. Go to www.ogdenmuseum.org. Uh, uh, and if you go to the exhibitions page, uh, Susan has her own tab. This will be archived there, as well as uh, images uh, 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 from the exhibition and the wall text. So Susan, is there some place uh, people can visit to see more of your work online? Uh, my website was um, a little bit um, old, older uh, website, but it's there. 
uh, SusanPlum.com, www.SusanPlum.com. She'll be working on updating that, but in the meantime, I you can do some it. work and uh, you can contact her if you're interested in uh, exhibiting the work or purchasing the work. So, uh, Susan, again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Bradley. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.